want to first have our guests uh, uh, make the first comments. Um, and you know what? Uh, min just said, how the hell are you going to curate this? <laughs> and and, and I, that's, I, I guess that's my job. But, but I have some keywords here, I, and um, I just want to throw them out in the air. You know, today we heard uh, a, um, uh, about coopetition, um, about analyzing in a precise way the existing condition. We also hear, heard about um, a residual space and residual space as, as, as a place for making and thinking. We also heard about post-human forced reality in a way. What is, what is reality in the post-human? Um, we heard about, uh, we heard about the role of infrastructure in terms of interior architecture. I thought that was very interesting. And uh, reinventing the, f the, the fashion world with hybrid industries. We also heard that socialist cities are somehow more advanced in terms of production. This, I, I never knew this, uh, but that's good. We also heard about canceled redevelopment and missed modernism. I think that's, that's really, um, and, and then the idea of the palimpsest. Uh, and so the, these are some of the themes that, that I think we, we heard converging. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw the mic at someone that would want to, to speak. And I, and I would want our, our guests to actually speak first. Can I hand the mic over? Okay. I thought ladies first, but thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Thorsten Schütze, Imnida, Songyong Kwon Terkyo, thank you very much for uh, inviting us, our Department of Architecture, and particularly also me, to listen to your very interesting introduction of the the comments and then also the approaches that you uh, follow up with your studios. And um, I think, so if you ask me, the approaches already reflect very nicely the comments here in Seoul. And so the question is, what cut could I contribute? Because we, we don't contribute with the studio yet. We hopefully might do something next spring. So I thought I'd just comment generally a little bit on my uh, assumption on the comments and on Seoul and what is important for Seoul. And uh, you mentioned the four resources, air, water, energy, earth. In the last presentation, we learned that the old map of Seoul was based on streams. That is also my conclusion somehow that the traditional Seoul is actually a water city. And when we think about the resources and uh, quality of life, what is essential, what we are doing as architects and urban planners, I mean, it's all about uh, the people. Um, and when we look back, we see that the sustainable that that soul and its society are not reflect now on different periods and let's say Confucianism, but the metabolism in a framework of managing resources was very sustainable in Seoul in the past, but in the framework of the industrialization and development. Uh, Seoul became a world city, a world capital, with a lot of po uh, possibilities. I think it's now the third richest city of Asia, Fo third or fourth, so it's very, very uh, rich. But concerning air quality, it has uh, the second, I just read that yesterday, the second highest uh, fine dust pollution in Asia after Beijing. You can't see that, but it's really not contributing to the life quality. That's very much related with high density of cars. Um, we don't have a, we saw that in the presentation, the resource management is really a challenge. So um, I think what, what all these studios, what we could address is really enhancing the quality of life and uh, yeah, let me, before I hand over the microphone to the next speaker, because we are already very late today, um, maybe uh, just talk a little bit about uh, future production or future life. There was the question, how would um, the new industrial revolution look like? And I just learned that 3D printing, for example, uh, if you think about production, 
we can save 90% of energy for metal products that we produce by laser 3D printing. This is 10% of the original energy. We can save 60% of the weight. So the flight industry, Airbus, is doing that now already for, for their uh, parts, components for the, for the planes. So that means if we think about trade and how life could be organized in the city, we actually don't need to think anymore about ordering something online because we only have to distribute a smaller amount of raw product somewhere and we can produce the final product where it is bought or traded. So that means that the whole uh, need for transport, for mobility, could change if we address it as planners and architects in an appropriate way. And that also refers to what we learned today during your presentations regarding uh, the, the use of space. So how we distribute living, recreation, sleeping, housing, uh, working in the city. So I mean, in the past we said IT will change our way to work because we don't have to commute so much anymore because we can could work from home with our computers. In, in some companies, in some countries, that works better, in some not. So that means that it's also uh, the question of the society, how to deal with these technologies and, and, and use it in the planning in a way uh, that we can uh, have a very livable, healthy and uh, happy future. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm Yoon Hee Lee from the Yuhan University. Okay, um, I probably state me as a, I came to Seoul in 2003, so it's like 13 years. Before, I didn't study architecture in here, but uh, I'm Korean. 100%. The Seoul is not and so I'm sort of uh, seeing the Seoul as a foreigner, also as a the the uh, Korean. Uh, 2003, I sort of start the uh, Uljiro area, also this area as a new, and then I'm not from Seoul too, so it's a totally new city, and then I. The, the the documentation and finding and about the city research all the professor are doing with the student I sort of did it uh, really uh, not in deep research but then at 2003 but then the after 13 years later I think it changed a little bit but then some of the area are changed dramatically but then some of the area stay as the same. So uh, when I listen to all professors' presentation about the studio, and and um, I think every professor and student probably uh, ha will have a dilemma that that uh, do we need to keep, do we need to try to keep the smallness or the oldness or the traditional things or the slow master uh, making of Dongdaemun and Ujiro area, or we are fully 100% or 200% adapting tech-savvy Korean technology into this development. I think everybody will have a uh, agitating between we'll keep the old or we'll go ahead to the future or the, the fourth evolution. I think there will be the dilemma of all the studio and then I think the student will making a position for their uh, uh, project. I, I think that will be the, our whole uh, issue of this uh, uh, international studio. And, and one thing is also, um, uh, so I think that will be the, everybody's the, uh, pr uh, uh, challenge. And then I think that has to be clear. And one thing, I w today I hear the existing and then the documentation, what's happening here, but then I didn't really hear much, maybe because of time framing. But then I think what, w what the, w with this research and designing 
and master planning everything what will will eventually will uh, be shared as a common for every studio and not individual probably do the studio project and then as a team uh, but then I think the as a studio uh, has to make it clear what will uh, be the challenge and then what will be a comment and then what the comments that we are we are proposing will improve to the future i think that has to be clear outcome from the what we are doing with the studio and then of course it will be the my challenge to my uh, studio too and then the last thing is i probably want to uh, make a recommendation to the the our coordinator professor Hong, is because we're hearing like really nice word new vocabulary that each professor are proposing or I, I, I assuming each students are also proposed to the, uh, the professor so maybe it will be this is a really good opportunity because it's a really vast area and everybody and 2017 with this kind of a uh, setup I think this is the best way to collecting all the data so it will be better that maybe we will have a big data or the SBIS vocabulary book coming out of uh, all this 10 or 11 studio coming from the all over the world. Maybe that will be the good idea we'll gather all that information at the same time. Okay, thank you. Excellent, excellent. I have, I have a response, but not yet. Hello, I'm Suran from Hong University. I'm also working on a studio. We are part of studio. We have a workshop uh, next week planned. And I'm uh, working on the Changshin Dong, looking at the light manufacturing, especially the um, garment industry. So I've been um, kind of wondering, looking at all this, and also working on my site, um, and also looking at the big data the users collected, and how it sh was showing the average people working in the industry is like 50 something years, years old. Uh, and I think it's this question that I'm asking is kind of related to the question of keeping the old or how to move to the forwards. Because um, like in Changshin Dong, looking at this garment industry also, it's very nostalgic and people want to keep it and it's the character of the uh, village. But people, the young people are not coming in. So we're asking, is this, I mean, our studio theme is to how to find ways to revitalize the garment industry. But the reality is how the industry is moving, the whole garment production is moving to Vietnam for the lower age uh, ways, and uh, it's just better for the make money making. So now we are asking like how to attract young people, and then it's a question of also how to move forward to the new um, new way of making that we can part, uh, we can bring participation of the young people and young generation. So I think it's really the balance between keeping the old and to how much, uh, how uh, much of extension and also bringing the new blood into this whole uh, production. So I think the, uh, the question of bringing all these um, um, SNS and all the information data. So I think that's one way to and I think the, the hard question is how to bring that into the spatial condition. So that was the, that will be the challenge of, of your studio. Um, so that was something that I've been um, keep thinking. Also, I was very inspired by all these um, presentations because when I was walking by, you know, like for example, the Pyeongha Shijang and looking at all these products really um, uh, displayed in a wrong way to my aesthetic <laughs> eyes, but looking at that as something beautiful and something that's very different from like um, all this Zara or H&M. Um, and I think what we have all here, and this is great that we, is with all new eyes and new thinking, what we have and repackaging into something very valuable and something very different from other other places in the global uh, world. So I think this is a very great opportunity to kind of um, bringing out values, values that we haven't really realized by people, um, people living here and just seeing them every day. Um, so I'm really grateful to be participating in this uh, full studio. Thank you.
Um, I want to uh, second the, uh, the um, idea of collecting the terms, the terminology that's come up, and I think there should be a glossary, mm -hmm. a glossary of terms, because I think that the number of really interesting ideas that are embedded in those terms is a direction for a new kind of urbanism. Um, I think with the glossary, we could put together a compilation of concepts. There's been an amazing range of concepts here and approaches to the city, and that that diversity and heterogene heterogeneity of those concepts should be maintained uh, it right down to in, in very precise detail. And then, you know, it kind of leads to, um, and I love the data. The data is absolutely fantastic, and so are the graphics like that make it accessible. It's not, as somebody said, the sheets of just numbers, but it makes it accessible. And I also want to go back to your book, the, the North Korean Atlas. It's almost like I want an atlas for this region because it raises the question, how do we know something? How do we as architects get to know something? And some of these approaches are very familiar to us, spatial analysis, you know, transportation routes, you know, things like that. But then there's other ways that the data and these photographs and your observations, these amazing detailed observations that allow us to know something or the, you know, bringing Hong Kong to Seoul and that observation and how that overlays and how we could read a city through another city, those methods. And so there's, an, there's a, so the, the, this, con, this, this atlas that I'm imagining has, you know, glossary concepts, um, uh, methods. Uh, the way you have approached the city, each one of them has been articulated very clearly, and I think that's something that should be maintained in some form of documentation of this. And it, it's all pointing to me to a kind of multifaceted manifesto, not the Athens Charter, not the Lasseraz Declaration, uh, you know, 1928, 19, you know, those of, of, the, of the CM, but a kind of new kind of manifesto for the complexity of the modern s metropolis. We're no longer in cities. We have gone beyond all of those declarations because they were designing for cities and we are designing for a scale that and complexity that in fact brought down that institution because they couldn't handle the complexity. And so here we begin to see uh, that complexity and how our, what are our strategies. So I, I think that's it. The other thing I'd like to see is uh, history and how this intervention of the acupuncture and this kind of careful uh, point system in the city relates to the broader history of the urbanization or modern the modern city and it really is a departure and yet it is a continuity and finally I'll just say that uh, I'd like to see um, imminent how what is and I'm this is a bigger outside of the domain of these actual studios but I'd like to know how I understand commons as it has been discussed by these presentations. I'm still not so clear about what an imminent common is and how that is different from the economic political commons that you discussed or a young, ma uh, young men discussed uh, and how it's different from let's say earth, air, fire and water. What does the imminent quality bring? And so then there's another quality. I think one of the slides had it was the human in there and then the human, uh, there, I mean, we've we're defining this in very physical terms, but there are other commons that we have, emotional commons, spiritual commons, uh, you know, that, that begin to define a different kind of, you know, social commons that begin to define a different thing. And I'm not sure what imminent means, but I'd like that, I'd like that to be defined s in some point uh, as an overall question. And so that's all I have to say. Excellent. Wow. <laughs> Good. Thank you for organizing. Um, Chung, can you? Could I ask my TA to bring a pen and piece of paper oh, up to end? <laughs> oh, you don't, you don't need this? No, okay, 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 thanks. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm just kind of uh, joining at the last moment, so uh, I have, I, I, this is my second time that I actually observed the process of this project uh, at the Biennale itself. And, uh, and I kind of start to get a little bit of some uh, insight into how it's being organized in some way. For, uh, and the uh, first thing I think that I under better understand what uh, Professor Beyoung mean means by the notion of commons uh, uh, much more uh, than before. And I think it's a very, it has a great potential to be uh, a very, let's say in, in simple word, deep and critical 
uh, and uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, I wonder in terms of questions about how that this uh, relates not beyond the physical and spatial manner, that it also could uh, engage with the notions of political and economic and uh, perhaps social issues, right? Uh, and uh, the reason why I say that is because uh, in general, also like I'm an outsider to this city, and uh, so in a kind of impressionable way that I s begin to understand so we're in a very kind of general way is that it is kind of a half, it's, it's a complex mosaic of uh, half high rise and half low rise landscape you know and I feel that it has a certain historical narrative why we are at this point right and 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 why is that important is because uh, not just uh, this city but probably throughout other cities in the world uh, and uh, that at a point of certain juncture a uh, point of uh, uh, Sort of unclarity, what would be the next step, right? And uh, and here in Seoul, uh, that issue becomes also important. As uh, let's say, for example, uh, an era of Jagebar is uh, kind of losing its uh, uh, its historical uh, phenomena, and. Uh, there's more interest now to find an alternative way of continually processing, processing the city uh, toward the future. And, and Jagebar, by the way, is a very, I think is actually internationally the most unique economic, social, political history ever. There's no other cities and countries that where that people have uh, contributed their own properties individually, I mean, theoretically, right? And to develop a massive area at one time, and almost the whole nation profited for about 30 years. Uh, the, the people profited, the city profited, and uh, the construction company profited. It was like not only win-win situation, but it was actually win-win-win. This kind of uh, obsessions, uh, this uh, uh, addiction has really greatly driven and made the physical landscape of the city. Right? And that what really drove that, you know, in terms of the ideology of the state and the economy of the corporation and social culture of the Korean people, family, individual included, right? and how that could be examined and uh, as well as the physical architectural urban uh, conditions. I think I would like, let's say, risk to say that these three things that I mentioned before may have a greater power and importance than uh, the, perhaps the things that we are looking into from our own uh, not my own, but on your own professional perspective. And, uh, and I think this also deals a historical aspect. Maybe the way Annie uh, mentioned historically, the way I see it, which I like, is also that in respect to what was presented today was a kind of puncturing, acupuncturing into the land. And just like the Japanese drove the uh, metal stake into uh, Namsan, right? that what is the metaphysical history of the Korean uh, that you can actually extract from, it, from the ground, so to speak. But uh, the other way to look at it is that kind of in a broad, uh, 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 in an aerial or territorial sense, how that, that it also contains a history and that may perhaps speak more about aspect of infrastructural uh, 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 perhaps an idea of a common, right? Yeah. And uh, the the last thing maybe I would say is that maybe I liked 
I mean, I don't have any conclusion to this, but I think things that people have spoke raises certain questions to me. Uh, and one would be the idea of a common, and I don't know who mentioned whether that the, in Joseon Dynasty, I can't remember who mentioned that king owned everything. I don't know if that's true. You know, you know, as a principle, right, right. And it, it, that made me question about whether there was a properties uh, uh, in Joseon Dynasty or not. It probably was, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, right. So in the sense of the common idea, like the picture that you showed with on the street with the uh, kids laying down playing, that's a very, very kind of uh, 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 image of dichotomy. One in the sense that the property, the street is a prop as a property, is uh, common or public uh, uh, owned space, presuming that no uh, private citizen owned that and it's owned by the city. And at the same time, the image of the children, uh, let's say if they're not from one family, they're friends, right? It creates a common uh, relationship, common uh, uh, space between them, uh, you know, right? So it's not, it's sort of, it borders, it partly is private occupation of common space, but it also that the way that it's being used is also common, right? right. And uh, so the, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm making, I'm losing myself here a little bit, but, um, whether the space is common, I think you mentioned about that, right? And uh, w and then the space is in car in terms of a theoretical, metaphysical aspect, but in the reality, it becomes a land, it becomes property, right? And uh, that also kind of makes me think about in the socialist uh, cities uh, how that's different. And, uh, and then it makes me think about a larger picture where the, the last two great uh, po socialist politics of the 20th century, uh, which are actually, uh, uh, one is this communism, the other is actually fascism, right, has been now absolutely defeated by liberalism, right? And that are we really satisfied with this? And what is the idea of a common in this now uh, uh, totalitarian landscape of liberalism? And are we really seeking for a new terminology of a common that may project something of a new political idea, which will definitely were defined and regulate uh, and project about the future of the city? So that's the last uh, kind of question that I came up with. Yeah. And to extend Kyung's uh, last uh, comment, uh, I'm I'm very excited by the the fact that we have a a group of studio and a, a network of studios that are working with the within the Biennale context. Uh, biennales, art biennales don't have studios. I think because we are an architecture and urbanism biennale that it is actually quite natural for us to, to be in this environment. And so uh, as the director, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, how will this become an exhibition? You know, this is, this is John's work. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, I think, you know, we are in the midst, we are together with, uh, with leading uh, teachers and I think I would, I understand that you have all been doing, at least maybe in the past decade, that you've um, been thinking about new forms of studios and studio presentations. And I think that the curatorial challenge that the Biennale gives you, I think, is probably a good thing. That because I think the idea of the modernist project has long been dead. And that, uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, SNU just went through the accreditation process. And you know, this thing asks you to do projects. <laughs> like they are still in the modernist mode that architects do building projects. And, and, and I would think that the curatorial challenge specifically asks for us not to just show projects. 
it, it, it has to show a certain environment, it has to engage a larger uh, population that, that, that understands the issues in a particular sort of spatial way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, I would expect, and, and I, I am really excited to see how the studios coalesce into a curatorial project because this is not just a kind of, we need to do exhibitions, but it sort of presents a challenge of what is the architect doing? What, how does the architect present the ideas that is part of this imminent reality? Yes. And so I think it's, it's inherent into the thematic and, and the larger sort of uh, situation of the architectural and urban community. Uh, could, could I say one, one quick thing? Uh, intervene and then, um, I, I know what we're gonna do. I do. You, you <laughs> I can tell you right now what we're going to do. <laughs> uh, I, I, actually, there's a lot of things to say, but, but um, uh, I, I, one of the uh, commons I was arguing for, and it never made it into the list, was archiving. Archiving, archiving is, is <laughs> m my f my one of my favorites because uh, in my mind, archiving and mapping is actually a catalyst for change. It's not something that you put in a drawer. It's, it's something that you look at over and over again. And so... I would, I, I'm recommending our studios to take two, two actions. One is imminent analysis. I'm calling it imminent <laughs> analysis now. Um, a, a, a analysis on the site, because architects, uh, you're right, we, we shouldn't just design buildings. We, uh, that, that era is actually over. We are really good at analysis, and you, we saw that today. Uh, so uh, part of the exhibit, I think this idea of the imminent analysis is it compel it's a political act. An analysis is a political act. It compels people to, to rethink of an alternate future. And then I think our projects, since we do have to fulfill the, the, the requirements of the school, accreditation <laughs> requirements, I think that, that from the Im imminent analysis, there should be s design instigations that are born from it. And, and going back to the political, I think the design instigations are actually a manifestation of the analysis in a political way. It, it's a political act that kind of uh, compels us and it's born from the analysis. So I'm thinking if we can keep, this, keep these kind of roles, we will have amazing projects. <coughs> Thank you. I, I just wanted to touch upon um, maybe a, a point of self-criticism towards myself and also towards architects. And I learned this through speaking to anthropologists. I think we're, as architects, we're obsessed with the future. Obsessed. Always it's a better tomorrow, a better vision, improve society, improve air quality. But we forget the here and now. And I think, I think the essence of this Biennale is imminent. Imminent is so close to the here and now. And that's why, in my opinion, we've got to be understanding of the here and now, of the e every day. Anthropologists don't judge. We always judge. And I think we've got to understand how the city works. And you got this, this many texts. Desserteau is, uh, is a fantastic philosopher who looks at this, and he doesn't judge what he sees in front of him. He says, this is how it operates. These are the networks. This is how you could absolutely change a comma that might have an implication. And I think if we set upon the visions where we, we, you know, we, we want a better tomorrow, we've fallen in the trap of the modernists and we're not giving time to the here and now. And I think this is one of the places, so which has potentially one of the most vibrant here and nows that I know and that people don't know about. And instead of saying there's a better tomorrow, there is an imminent now. And I think that's interesting. I like it, I like it. We, we have time for one more comment. Uh, a point one point five comments. Uh, so it's it's another request is that uh, that I would like, for example, Peter, the Hong Kong situation, Rafael, the the Boston situation. I would love that that is still there and be part of the the, the curatorial um, uh, projects. And then also, I think we have a danger of making these distinctions. Uh, between smallness and bigness, I think. That was obviously not the intention, but for example, Zara and the shop in Tongdaemun are intricately linked, actually. Maybe they have a different aspect, but logistically, they are intrinsically linked. And so we have to actually capture that uh, rather than sort of present them as two different things. That's good. Uh, 
who am I throwing this money? Like, it's almost like throwing the, the wedding bouquet, whoever catches it. Uh, do you think a comment from, from the audience? Does anyone want to comment? Anyone? Anyone? This is like really awkward situation in the middle of the arena. Um, okay, so uh, I was really fascinated by uh, all, the, all you guys' proposals and the fact that and by Biennale can be sort of initiated uh, through various sort of studies uh, with students with a certain amount of time is actually a really interesting proposal. And um, I'm also really fascinated by the glossary idea and and that that, that is true that there's many kind of terminologies that uh, I felt like should I have to know that you know that uh, already, and that probably I wasn't really sure. And that was the uh, neoliberal urban condition or ne le neoliberal city that was mentioned. And I think it was you, uh, Jorge, who was talking about it. That like uh, for me, um, it has been talked about so much, but then like how does it apply into the reality that you analyzed? For instance, like how does it differ from what what? we would so-called the hipster uh, uh, sort of change uh, throughout several areas that you were mentioning. Because some of the analysis that you showed were, for me, had some mixtures between the pre-existing conditions that were com continuing from the, let's say, for this industrial heavy industry era where, um, you know, facade being the site of activities or, or um, or maybe the integrations of everyday into the business uh, sector, like eating in the shop or something like that, and that I found this kind of continuation from the former. Whereas you find, um, you know, new activities like the second floor being kind of the open site of terrace, like European city or whatever, and that is kind of new finding. So I, I wonder, like, what your judgment on that kind of analysis on the neoliberal change or kind of the characteristic that you saw, maybe. Well, I, I I wanted to introduce this this term, the neoliberal urbanism, probably because well, I think we can see it in all the cities, but in 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 Tokyo, especially uh, coming with the Olympics very very soon, it's so present. So it's basically this idea. I mean, in the functional functionally city, still you had the government planning. So there was a the pl government. Well, in, it depends on the uh, mm, political situation, but in democratic countries, at least, a uh, 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 democratic government chosen by the people planning the city. But what we have now uh, is uh, that the governments are becoming smaller and smaller, um, and uh, they are really outsourcing planning. Uh, planning activity itself and public space is being privatized, and you can see it in, in Tokyo. Uh, if you look at master's plans done now by by the go by the government, they are so sketchy. They look like PowerPoint presentation by students, like first year students, like uh, very simple. And then they give those huge uh, uh, portions of land to big corporations who are the really the, the 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 urban planners, right? So there is a transferring of responsibilities from from the public realm or governmental realm, which was the functional city to the uh, small private corporate, well, not, not big, uh, not small, huge uh, uh, corporations. So I think this is w one, one issue. And I think it's interesting to, to bring it here because it's interesting that this event itself is a kind of anti-neoliberal kind of approach because uh, the city, for example, I heard today that they have canceled so many of those tabula rasa development. The fact that uh, they didn't ask super huge corporations but more like academic people to come and bring ideas i think it's a huge very interesting change uh, which is not happening in in tokyo i think it's not happening in most of the cities th that i know uh, not in not in new york <laughs> not in tokyo i mean this is happening this is very special i think i, I really think what is happening now is really special and uh, this was one question i think the second question was um about uh, you mentioned the hipster kind of approach and yeah I must admit that um, maybe this kind of uh, point of view that we are bringing is it can provoke this hipster kind of effect of gentrification 
So that's the, that's the problem. I mean, once you find value in the everyday life, it brings economic value, and then it, ch it starts changing the city and gentrifying it. I don't have a, an answer for that. <laughs> I mean, I think this is a really, mm, I think there is an, an interesting point in gentrification in which uh, at certain level, it's, it brings very positive energy, but then when all the Unicuro and Zara and all those things are coming, then uh, the, the qualities disappear. So I think somehow I'm not completely negative of gentrification. I think there are certain levels in which we can use it, and, and the issue is how to keep it in that level so that there is an interesting mixture between new points of view and and all old, old uh, or let's say more traditional um, lifestyle co uh, living together. Well, I don't know if I reply to your question. Um, you know what? I think this is a good place to start, keeping it at that level. I, I want to I wanna end with that com comment. Uh, you know, I, I think we could go on for another, I don't know, couple hours. We should, actually. Why don't we go, go on? No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> the, uh, but uh, this is, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm feeling guilty that I'm cutting this short, but I'm also feeling hopeful that I'm cutting this short because that means there's a lot of conversation to come. And we are so privileged, actually. This is great that you... Uh, closed with this, t that this event is supported by the Seoul City government. I mean, it's 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 this is a this is a huge privilege. Um, it's a great privilege to have all of you guys stick around. I hope you got uh, something out of this, and I wish we could have engaged you more. And it's a huge privilege to have, you know, all these studios come together today. Thanks so much. You want to do that? No, no. Oh, for me? Yeah. But it's not.